just a hack. It's just an absolute hack. And he gets his ass kicked by his teammates every week. It's just, you know, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Welcome back to Hack City. Joe DeLeon, Sean Anderson, two former college football players from the University of Rhode Island. Today, we are bringing you a preview of the quarterfinal round of the 2023 FCS football playoffs. Before we get to that, though, Sean, can you share with our listeners a quick word from Bet Online? I'd love to. Before we talk about the third round, as I'm going to call it, just want to let everybody know uh, Bet Online is your number one uh, destination for all your sports wagering information. Up to the minute sports wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. Bet Online is the top spot for everything pro and amateur sports. Head to Bet Online today and remember to use remember to use our promo code Believe. That's B L E A V for your fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you, Sean. So we have these games to talk about. I very quickly, whenever we make a mistake, we have to provide a correction. I made a mistake. Uh, when talking about the Montana State kicker situation, the blocked extra point, I thought it was the six foot eight kicker that was in because my assumption was that that was the full time starting kicker. What I did not know though is apparently um, they have a second kid who kicked in that game against North Dakota State. So I made an incorrect assumption there. However, my analysis still stands though. The, the kick came out low, the trajectory was low. That's why that ball was tipped. Um, Moving on from that, you, I'll let you, you get away with the we on that one. I'll let you get it. I'll let you get away with the we. I didn't say because I didn't, I didn't say we. You. What you, you, you said we on the show when we make a mistake, oh. and I'll, I'll let you get away with that one because I did not correct you real time. Uh, so I think us as a show in wait, solidarity wait, 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 can wait, wear the way that. You're, the way you're saying that you're making it seem like you knew that I was wrong and you didn't say anything. Us you didn't know that I was in wrong. Solidarity can wear you, this. You didn't know that. Okay. You didn't. I. I mean, I'm absolving you. I was the one who made the mistake. You don't. You're not responsible for any of this. But now you're trying to make amicably. You're, you're you're trying to make it seem like you knew that that wasn't the right kicker, and you're trying to make it okay. All right. I, I just. I I'm fine with the we in this instance. I'm fine okay. with the we. Okay. I get it. Uh, <laughs> uh, South Dakota State versus Villanova. Sean, let's start ourselves off with the one versus eight matchup. So. This game brings a lot of intrigue for the reason that we've got two very different stylistic teams. We had Villanova last week have this um, explosive offense versus explosive offense battle, and we got to see all of their talented weapons shine. Jalen Sanchez, we've got Raywan Pringle, who had a performance that was fantastic, Jalen Jackson. All of these guys in this Villanova offense exploded, and there were so many different players that got involved in that performance for us to see what they're capable of doing. Now, they are thrown into the mix of a very difficult circumstance of having to travel to Brookings, South Dakota, which is one of the hardest places to get a victory. It's supposed to be 34 degrees on Saturday. It looks like there's not really any snow in, in these usually typically snowy regions. We know that that can change at any time. But where, what are your thoughts on, on this game, Sean? I'm glad you pulled up the weather. I pulled it up myself. Uh, Saturday day, 35, considerable clouds early. The night, 15 degrees. I'm glad we went when we went with 15 degrees at night. That was fine. The last time it was 15 degrees, I had to cut open my roommate's uh, window screen with a credit card and sneak through his window Winnie Pooh style and, uh, and, and break into my own house because I didn't have a key. Avoiding those treacherous cold nights is important the weather makes an impact and we touched on it a little bit on sunday but these midwest and and mountainous region teams it is tough for the east coast teams moving to a different climate because all across the east coast is pretty similar but it's a different type of cold montana cold is different utah cold is different colorado the dakotas all of it makes an impact you have to assume there's going to be less offensive production from Villanova. South Dakota State's used to it. They're the number one team in the nation for a reason. It's going to be a fun game. I think that this Villanova team has been peaking in November and late. This, they have been as hot a team as been this season in FCS football. They will give South Dakota State the best run they've had all season. SIU gave them good burn, and SIU put it all out there. We saw what they were able to do against Idaho. Villanova, I think, is going to be the best offense, 
they're them and Montana State make it really close. Best offense that South Dakota yeah. State has seen all season. I think Villanova's playmakers might edge out Montana State's skill positions a little bit more, even though Montana State has the dynamic quarterback duo. Regardless, South Dakota State will get tested. This is another test for them, but they have been battle hardened this season. We've we've made uh, a point every time that we've discussed South Dakota State, not only in their pray, uh, not only talking about how good they are, but how good their competition is, how they didn't have a cupcake schedule, how they played difficult teams all season. They're going to be prepared for this. Villanova going to need to execute at a near perfect level. I look at for this game, and I, I I don't think it's a shock to sit here and say that I think that South Dakota State wins this football game. But the reasoning why I think that this is not clear cut, not like a guarantee, but why we have evidence of it probably leaning in South Dakota State's favor is that the teams that gave them the biggest struggles was SIU, as you just mentioned. That was a game that the final score was, I just had it in front of me, 17 to 10. And then the other close game was Montana State, which was 20 to 16. Those are the only two games, Sean, that they scored under 30 points and that it was within a score that I can see in front of me. Unless I'm I'm missing something here. Those are the only two games. And what those two teams have in common is that they are physical on defense. They have strong secondaries. And they run the ball really well. And they control the time of possession. Villanova does not play that style of football. No. They just don't. And I think that more often than not, when we get these instances of a physical team playing a more you know, kill you in space type of a team, you go with the physical team. And the evidence that we have here, when they've played these explosive, productive offenses, they beat Youngstown State 34 to nothing. They beat you and I 41 to six. I am reluctant to believe that Villanova matches up well enough to beat South Dakota State. Could they give them a scare? Absolutely. It's certainly possible. They can maybe catch them off guard. Maybe there's an early turnover, something along those lines. But because of the two teams that have given them fits, the way that they were built, it's nothing like Villanova. So I have to lean, of course, with South Dakota State. Yeah, that SIU defensive line has been really impressive all season. They're stout. They're strong as hell. Villanova's defensive line, not as much that everyone's got big fellas on the inside. So before you start showing me the videos and, and telling me they got a 320 pounder, everyone's got a big fella on the inside, but we would have taken more notice of notice of it by now. The trenches is going to be so impactful for Villanova, how they hold up, not win. I don't think they win the trenches, how they hold up against both sides of the ball, offense and defensive line for South Dakota State, just hold up. Hold up the best that you can because those big fellas on the O-line are going to get it moving on you. They're going to get it moving. So you got to play your toughest game of the season. Uh, just you, you have to find a different gear to play in the trenches versus South Dakota State. They're, they're, they're big, they're strong, they're physical, and they don't give an F who you are lining up in front of you. So good luck. Hold up the best you can, Villanova. South Dakota versus North Dakota State, Sean. This game is fun just from the perspective of thinking that both these teams play in domes. And, you know, here we are. We're getting uh, this game being played at USD in their dome, in their indoor facility. Um, So there's not really any weather factor here. There's not a team traveling that is going to be exposed to a situation that they're not used to. They're playing inside. These teams, though, a lot of similarities. They run the football really well. They have physical defensive fronts, like a lot of these teams that are still sticking around, good offensive lines. I would argue, and this is going to be a take that some North Dakota State fans might not love, I think Aiden Bowman's a more proficient passer than Cam Miller is. This is a really big opportunity. This season for sure. This season for sure. This is a big opportunity for both these programs. I think it's worth noting, I was really impressed, as I said on the last show, that North Dakota State got the involvement of multiple running backs, which they hadn't done a lot enough this season. They, they got all of their guys that were key 
for their rushing success last last game involved and got them rolling. Tamrick Williams, Rajah Nelson, TK Marshall all had strong performances and got big yards per clip. So the thing to monitor here is if they do what they did against Montana State, I think that they can win this game again and continue this. It's not I don't want to call it a Cinderella run because it's not. You're a national championship winning team almost every single year. But the unseeded run that they could possibly go on. It's I find this, you know, I, I've kind of been talking about this season for the FCS, uh, wondering which teams are going to implement that Montana State style where they have the two running quarterbacks and they have their mobile and they got big arms and, and and just deciding, all right, let's let's do a little copycat league. South Dakota threw a little bit of copycat in in the back door where nobody really know, or at least I didn't really notice it till I started till I saw North Dakota State get back last week. Watching what they did last week reminded me, oh my God, that's what South Dakota has been doing all year. So mm-hmm. South Dakota took the playbook from North Dakota State with the packed running back room, an efficient quarterback, and a, a hard-hitting defense. And they just said, all right, we're going to do the Bison game plan. And then this year, they're down. So they didn't get as much recognition for doing that and performing it well all season. All, all year, they did it great. They Almost, almost to a T. I mean, all plays are the same, basically, but the way in which they did it was very reminiscent of how North Dakota State has operated within their running back rooms for the last couple of years. And I couldn't make that parallel until I saw North Dakota State unlock it versus Montana State last week. And now I'm looking at this game like, holy hell, who's going to break more runs? I'm not worried about the, the air. I, I, I mean, I think South Dakota has the advantage in the air, but it will not come this game. I don't think comes down to the passing game. Sure. They might get a pass. Each team might get a passing touchdown. One of them might get two, but whoever runs the ball and averages five yards a carry wins this game. The one that averages 4.2 loses. They both have great running back rooms, very deep running back rooms uh, when they're operating at, you know, efficient clip. It's worth noting that when South Dakota beat this team earlier on in the season, 24 to 19, I'm pulling up the box score here. And you know what? I look, I know it seems like I'm really hyper focused on this, Sean, but there's a lot of evidence to show that when they were their most successful, they were three backs deep. They rotated all of them. They got yeah. them all touches. I look at the the box score in this game that they lost. The leading ball carrier was Cam Miller with 12 carries for 65 yards. TK Marshall had seven. Uh, Barika, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this. Capinu had three carries. Cole Payton had eight. Tamrick Williams Williams only had seven. And then Rajah Nelson only had one carry. They got away from it. In the games that they've struggled, they've got away gotten away from it. And this isn't like a game where you're playing catch up either. This is a, a one score game. You didn't have to completely bail on what has been successful for you. Yeah. I also have to add to something that it's, you know, redundant to bring up, but we bring it up all the time. It is hard to beat a good team twice. And I think that is worth paying attention to. If you're a Bison fan, it's almost to your advantage that you lost to them the first time. It's going to be a fun game. If you know the teams, if you're just watching the game, it's going to be a lot of, Oh, that was a great, uh, that was a great tackle. One yard gained. A lot of that might be taking place. I don't particularly agree with North Dakota State having the edge. I still think South Dakota has it, and they played with more momentum, uh, more violence this year for sure. So I, I'm going to have to lean the Yotes. It's going to be closer than I expect, though. I know however much I'm blowing it out of proportion, I'm going to be coming back like, wow, it was close. It has to be. It just does. The first one was, this one will be. You know, three to five plays are going to determine it. Albany versus Idaho. Four versus five in the KB Dome. I got to tell you this, man. We said this on the the last show that we did. I'm right now, I'm really feeling like Albany's got it. You know, Albany's going to win this game. And I know that we've been Idaho supporters this year. But the way that we saw Idaho struggle with SIU, who is a really good defensive team. They only put up 20 points, and it took a field goal in overtime for them to win that game. I think a lot of their deficiencies, especially along their offensive line, it, it was it was exposed. We saw a lot of pressures on Giovanni McCoy 
And I'm telling you this right now, Albany's defensive front is better than SIU's. Their front seven is more productive and it is more talented than SIU's. That to me is the main, main thing that I'm hyper-focused on. Giovanni McCoy's got to get the ball out quick. And if he doesn't, he could be on his back for most of this game and Albany could end up winning it. Yeah, Idaho needs to find their consistency early. They need to get in a rhythm quick against Albany or else it could be a slog. It, uh, Albany is a team that is, it, it, they will just try to hammer the nail all game, slowly, 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 and then eventually the nail's in. A couple touchdowns later, a couple turnovers later, you're looking at the scoreboard. How are we down 28 points? That's how, that's how they're going to, they're just going to work you to death. Idaho, maybe I, if I was Idaho going into this game, the first quarter, I would t- try to take the top off on every set of downs that I had at least one play first down, second down, third down, all first quarter, one of those three that I'm guaranteed, I'm going to try to take the top off. I'm going to try to get a quick score, a big score, a momentum shifter, and a soul crusher. That's what Idaho needs to do. Get it to Hayden Hatton. Get it to him early. Mm. Get Albany thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God. They're getting – you have to win that mental game early because Albany is just going to be a model of consistency. They're just going to be that piston that keeps on firing. They have to get – They Albany could spare not one quarter – and I'd say not even a, not even a drive without getting it going quick. Quick quick shout out to Dylan Kelly, the linebacker from Albany, who is up for the uh, Buck Buchanan Award. We'll probably I think soon we're going to tape a show talking about uh, the finalists and like who we picked and who we think is going to end up winning the the um, those FCS awards. But uh, Dylan Kelly, they've got one of the best players in the country defensively, and that's not even the crazy part is like he might not even be the best player on that defense. Like there's four or five other guys that are equally as good as he is and as talented as he is. It's just, it's crazy for, for Idaho that they've come this far and they're running into a defensive buzzsaw a little bit. And I know again, we talk, we, we kind of poke fun at the, at, at the bias against the CAA for whatever reason. A lot of people don't like to give the CAA credit from these fan bases across the country, but I'm telling you right now, yeah. a good defensive CAA team is really freaking hard to to play against for, from personal experience of getting knocked around by those teams. It's tough to go up against. And just straight up SIU gave them fits good defensively. Montana is one of the few teams that beat them at the Kibbe dome. Really good, good defensively, really good run game. When we find these commonalities between opponents, we have to point to that evidence. And that's why I, I lean Albany. It's so tough because if Anthony Woods gets going for Idaho and he breaks off a couple nice 12 yarders or 15 yarders on the ground, that could shift a lot of stuff. Idaho needs their stars to show up. They need McCoy to show up. They need Hatton to show up and they need Woods to show up all in big roles. It's the playoffs. You got to get it to your big time stars that can make defenders miss or make them pay for a misread or a misassignment. I think I lean Idaho at home. I, I I I give a lot of credit to home teams in the playoffs. The Kibbe Dome is like a liminal space where just madness happens. And there's there's it, there's eccentricities, the the hanging goalposts, the the crazy shape, the mad fans. It's 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 like like really, if a dude were to create a stadium, we talk about you know dudes living arrangements. The Kibbe Dome would be like what you would say, hey, 21-year-old, build a stadium that would be uh, great for your team, uh, but hideous for other teams to play in. Make it uncomfortable for the visitors, uh, but a cult classic for the home team. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think the way to describe it. There's this... What, what there's do you think this... the inside of a can of cat food looks like? No, 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 no. that's not <laughs> it. There, you, do, do you know the, like, there's like a... Um, a reoccurring meme that like just always constantly pops up where it's like this existential, um, just completely barren, endless room. Like it looks like you're in like the most just like barren office building. That's got no furniture, no desks, 
just completely, utterly bare. Like, do you kind of know what I'm yeah, talking about? I do. I think it, you sent me it, one of these photos. Uh, I, I sent them to you uh, this I, week. Yes. I, did I actually? I mean, check if I did. But it, it it has this this existential feel to it, where you're in like another dimension, where you're you're in a linear plane where neither time <laughs> time nor any sense of of feeling or existence is present. It's a bit alien, I would say. The Kibbe Dome I, is so unique that- Did he, I send that to you? Uh, I need to see Something, this. man, I'm looking through here. God, there's a lot of horny DMs. All right, Jeez. don't out, don't out. Okay, from both of us, don't act, don't out You me, got don't a problem, me, brother. You send oh. me plenty of shit. <laughs> you send me plenty of questionable shit. Oh my God, you're absolutely right. This is I bad. Told, I told you. <laughs> This is, there's going to be no case. It's going to be, it's going to be, all right, are these the Hex City boys? Lock them up. I, I had that thought the other day that if either one of us gets, a, gets accused of something, <laughs> oh, oh. we're screwed. <laughs> oh, if you get a driving ticket, I'm, I'm going off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's, uh, <laughs> Uh, on that note, I, if either of us dies, we have to delete uh, the other oh, yeah. uh, Twitter account. That's that's a requirement. Yeah, no, you can't let anyone get into those DMs. Um, Furman versus Montana. This one's the this is the stylistic fight that I'm I'm happy about because this is like a really good matchup where both these te- like, this feels like Michigan versus Alabama. I'm not comparing either of these programs to one of them, and I have actually compared Montana to Alabama before because there are a lot of disturbing similarities. I think it's a bit astute. I think the, the, the way the fan base reacts. That, which, yes. but wait, by the way, quick tangent. Whenever you're bored, I'll send you the link. The past two weeks, I have somehow sparked, and this is the, the hilarious part about this. Montana fans were up my ass in the month of October and a little bit of November. Yeah. Alabama fa- fans have found me, and I am far more critical about a- Alabama, and I am unapologetic about it. There are now two or three videos that have like 500 plus comments, and half of those are some of those disturbing threats that have been directed towards me. I need to send them to you because you need to read them. So Montana Please, fans, you're not, you're not as bad as the Alabama fans that, that hate me. But back to what I was saying. This feels like Alabama versus Michigan because you got two hard-nosed teams that have strong offensive lines that have uh, two just like really good backs that run the ball well, and you've got quarterbacks that have been key for your success this season. I think for me, Montana obviously has the edge because they're at home, and we and we just spent a ton of time talking about the difficulties of traveling to play these um these teams that are far west in these mountainous regions and in in these in these just very difficult states to play environmentally. Yeah. But I think that if there is a path for maybe Furman to pull off an upset and for Montana fans that should pay attention to and and what could maybe go wrong, if they get Dominic Roberto rolling and they start to have early success running the football, that to me then sets up Tyler Huff to play a good game. If he doesn't have to, if everything doesn't fall on his shoulders, Tyler Huff is one of those guys that performs well when he's called upon more briefly than when he's called on often. I think he's a great quarterback. And if you put him in this position just to maybe every so often on these less high pressure throws, that is what makes this Furman offense quite dangerous potentially. And I think it really comes down to if this game does end up being close early and it's a little back and forth and they're both getting stringed together long drives and long rushing plays. For me, it's going to come down to, does Tyler Huff have a better game than McDowell? That's what it comes down to for me. I think that Furman needs to use Tyler Huff in the run game sparingly and pick their places because Montana is a team that will hit the run and hit the game out of your quarterback. They will punish him going out of bounds. We saw, uh, oh, yes. Remember, and I hate to draw to a to an FBS comparison. Remember when we saw Jackson Dart run all over the place against Georgia, and they took like eight. He took like five straight crazy shots. He was out of the yes. game. Yeah, Montana's defense is going to hit the hell out of the quarterback. So you have to use a quarterback who's mobile like this. 
you can't let them take those crazy shots. You can't, and it's a playoff game, and I know the competitors, and we saw it firsthand where it's, okay, we have to, somebody's got to step up, quarterback tries to put the team on his back, ends up, we, I, I, sorry, Paul Moraz, saw the hardest hit I've ever seen in my life where I think he cracked all of his ribs and got his ACL torn and got a concussion by a UNH defender. It's a dirty ass hit. One of the dirtiest hits I've ever seen. But I've never seen yeah. a human get hit like that uh, in my life. And, and Paul Moraz was just trying to make a play happen. You got to protect the QB in this one. You have to. It's going to be cold. It's going to be 34 degrees, a high, a 29 low. Get the ground game going. Get the big fellas up front warm. Dominic Roberto is going to do to the Montana defense, has the capability of doing to the Montana defense, what the Montana defense could do to Tyler Huff. He could wear your ass down. He could just churn you out. He has the possibility. You got to game plan it. And Furman's got a good offensive line, and they got good coaches, and they're they are ranked so high all season for a reason. It's going to be a fun one. It should be. I always worry about getting to these West Coast cold, frigid games for the warm teams. It's a different dynamic. It's a different play style. Really, I say if you're betting on this game, wait until about 30 minutes to kick. See how many Furman players come out with their shirts off. That, they, and see how they're testing. Don't, don't, don't do it, guys. Do not freaking do it. One thing that I, I was doing a little bit of uh, investigative journalism here. Oh, so yeah. I, I had I, I wanted to check before I made the statement that that I had the stats to back up what I'm saying. One th- really key factor here for I think why Furman could play this game closer than I think some people would expect. Montana's success defensively, they're really good on defense. But one of the things that we've seen that has made them even more successful and that has helped them dominate games, like the games that they've blown out their opponents, it feels like it's because they've turned the ball over and they've scored off of those turnovers. I look at last week, if you pull up their stats from last week, offensively, they actually didn't put up that many crazy numbers. But if you remember, there were a lot of really silly, stupid turnovers that happened pretty early on in that game for Delaware, and it took them out of it immediately. There was no recovery for that because they weren't ready to play in the snow, they weren't ready to play in the weather, but it's something that has happened seemingly all season long. To the tune of the fact that that on the season, they currently have and finished with 15 team interceptions. They also pulled off 12 team fumbles. And why I'm bringing all this up is that if there is a team that does not turn the ball over and protects it well, it's Furman. Five interceptions on the year for Tyler Huff, which is a fantastic total. And their only total fumbles lost. Actually, their only total number number of fumbles is six. They've only lost two of those. Oh, man. This is a team that very, very rarely turns the ball over. That, to me, is a Why very important game? factor. What, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm now not, we're going to get a muff just, punt. Wait, now we're wait, getting wait, a muff punt, man. <laughs> you know that's how it goes. Uh, the quarterback Look, is doing so I, good, and they're not losing the ball on fumbles. I, Here comes the muffer. Here comes the big drop. I'm picking Montana because Montana has been so good down the stretch. But I, I, we have to bring up here, for previewing this game effectively, we have to pay attention to the turnover battle. If you turn Furman over, you're winning the damn football game. Plain and simple. That's a great point. I'll also note uh, Clifton McDowell stepped up big time uh, this season. He only has two picks on the year. Impressive. He's been Does good. he really? I feel like he's yeah. had more than that. I'm seeing right here two picks. 2023, 14, about 1,500 yards, 11 touchdowns, two picks. Uh, what's his completion percentage? 60%, 60.3%. Better, I, it, I think at one point it was sub-60, so I think he's had a little bit of uh, inflation. Well, he's turned it on a little bit. Uh, Furman cannot take them lightly on uh, defense either. Montana's got some playmakers. they got some skill. They, they can score points. Obviously, the strength is a defense, but they can score some points. Folks, we'll see what happens this weekend. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. So much more action coming. We've been getting a ton of views this whole FCS playoffs. It's been going up every single episode. Make sure you are tapped in, subscribed at Joe DeLeon, at Sanderson Radio, wherever you get your pods. We'll be back with more. Enjoy the weekend of football.